part five of the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series is entitled the art of astrophotography so astrophotography is a hobby within a hobby it's where the art of photography meets the hobby of amateur astronomy so i began my journey as an astrophotographer many years ago and when i started we had one of these. We used these back then. So this is our old friend. This is a 35 millimeter single lens reflex or SLR camera. And I do not miss those days at all. Um, Cause film was a pain in the butt. There were times I thought I loaded the film, but it either tore in the spool or it came unraveled. And I thought I took a whole roll of images to find out I didn't take anything. So good riddance to the old 35 millimeter SLR camera. And frankly, today it is a dinosaur. All right, so if that doesn't wake you up, nothing will. So as usual, as you become accustomed to in the introduction to amateur astronomy series here, I always like to mention some books that are available for the astrophotographer. Uh, but I freely admit, I do not own any of these books. I started astrophotography, as I mentioned, back in the film days. Uh, so pretty much any book I own on astrophotography is back to that era. So uh, all my books are a little dated, but these are all some of the really uh, good ones that I believe are available today. Uh, there's the Deep Sky Imaging Primer by Charles Bracken. I had to mention this one, The Art of Astrophotography. I've been using this title long before Ian Morrison did with his book there, so I don't have like a copyright on it or anything, but seems like every time he sells a copy of this, he, he should give me a nickel, but I'm sure he won't. Um, and then there's uh, uh, Photography, uh, Night Sky. Those are uh, uh, fairly well-known books as well. There's also um, Astrophotography by Thierry Legault. Uh, he's a very well-known astrophotographer, as is Chris Woodhouse, who has the astrophotography manual. Uh, but again, I don't uh, actually own any of those books, so, so I can't highly recommend any of them specifically. Uh, but the bad thing about hard copy books in the days of digital imaging, which we're in now, is things are rapidly changing. They're changing all the time. Uh, so perhaps some of the best books on astrophotography are digital because they can be updated very rapidly. So Jerry Rodriguez, very well-known astrophotographer from New Jersey, he has a series of electronic books, you know, e-books. And here are just some of them here. Uh, his most recent one uh, deals with the smartphone. He's, he's mainly into smartphone astrophotography now. He's pretty much retired, so... He doesn't get into the really complicated astrophotography anymore, at least uh, according to him. So the great thing about these books uh, is they can be updated very easily and you can just download the updates. Uh, the one book I do currently own that's fairly modern is by Alan Dyer. So if you really want to get into the uh, main type of astrophotography we'll talk about today, doing nightscapes with a camera and tripod and maybe a star tracker, uh, this is the book to get. I highly recommend this book. Again, I do have this on my iPad and I uh, reference this quite a bit. So uh, it's called Nightscapes and Time Lapses. I haven't even got to the time lapse part yet. I've been kind of reviewing the uh, Nightscape part uh, as well. So there are two versions. There, there's the iBook. Um, the last I knew, that was about $28. It may have gone up a bit since then. So you can get the iBook for your uh, Mac-based machine like an iPad. It does have a PDF version that costs a little bit less because it doesn't have as many features. The Apple version is about 580 pages, while the PDF version is 425 pages. The Apple version has 20 embedded uh, videos, while the PDF version has links to videos because you can't really put uh, videos in a PDF file. Y you can, but it ain't easy. Uh, it does have 50 step-by-step -step processing tutorials. It has equipment reviews, software reviews, and even a really nice astronomy 101 section. So if you don't have Alan Dyer's book and you um, have an iPad especially, but even any ordinary computer uh, where you can open PDF files, which should be all of them, uh, I, I can't recommend this book more. 
So we'll begin talking about uh, the astro, the, the type of astrophotography that anybody could do. Uh, maybe some of you are, are, are just attending today to get your certificate, which again, you can only get if you're attending on Zoom. If you're watching this later on YouTube, don't contact me to try to get a certificate. But if you otherwise have no interest in astrophotography, this is the type that anybody could do. So we'll begin with tripod astrophotography. So first and most basic piece of equipment that you need is obviously the camera. And today there are a couple of options out there. We have the digital single lens reflex camera, the successor to the 35 millimeter camera. So in place of film, there's a CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductor sensor. And they come in uh, basically two varieties. There's, there's different sensor sizes of the DSLR. There's the full frame camera that basically has a CMOS chip the same size as a, a piece of 35 millimeter film. Uh, the sensor measures 36 by 24 millimeters. While there's also the crop sensor or the APS-C uh, sensor with Canon cameras, uh, they measure about 22.3 by 14.9 millimeters while with uh, Nikon, Pentax, and Sony, the crop sensor is a little bit bigger. It's about 23.6 by 15.6 millimeters. And when I gave this lecture uh, roughly 15 years ago, I recommended Canon above all else. But now uh, Nikon and even, even Sony, I, I don't know too much about the Pentax cameras, they have caught up to Canon in terms of uh, the image quality that the cameras produce. But the DSLR, even though it's still pretty much the mainstream type of camera, is becoming a dinosaur itself like the 35 millimeter camera before it because the digital single lens mirrorless camera, I'll call it mirrorless for short, it takes me too long to say DSLM, I, I say mirrorless a lot faster. So these are slowly beginning to replace the DSLR cameras. So they do have many advantages they're lighter, so they lack the relative bulk of the SLR mechanism um, because they don't have the SLR mechanism. Instead of a uh, optical viewfinder, it's a digital viewfinder. You, you're actually looking at an, an image through the viewfinder, or you can just use the uh, screen on the back. So because they're lighter, uh, they're good for light tripods or tracking platforms where weight can be critical. Uh, the short flange to sensor distance um, is shorter than digital SLRs. So they are uh, a little skinnier, a little more compact. They're usually a little smaller looking. Uh, so because the short flange to sensor distance is, is smaller, this reduces the back focus. And this allows almost any lens to be adapted. You just have to buy the special adapter for a different variety of lenses. So if you were a Nikon user and get a Canon mirrorless camera, you just need the simple adapter and you're good to go. So mirrorless cameras uh, have no edge shadows uh, cast by an upraised mirror or sensor masks. Uh, so their images are usually a lot cleaner from, from edge to edge. And they do have good on-screen focusing aid, aids too. So uh, the mirrorless cameras are going to be the successor to the old DSLR cameras. The DSLRs are still probably the most common because there's a wide variety of them out there, but the mirrorless ones are rapidly overtaking them. Obviously, you'll need a lens as well. Uh, you, you can, of course, buy a Canon or Nikon camera, for example, with the kit lens, but eventually you'll want to purchase something a little bit better. So for tripod, wide field astrophotography, you want something in the 14 to 50 millimeter range. You know, the, the, the zoom kit lens is a great place to start. You can at least tinker with it, but eventually it might be nice to get a higher end zoom lens or a fixed lens that, you know, has a fixed focal length. And again, because you're on a tripod, you want to stick to 14 to 50 millimeters. So you can buy the, the, the ones from Canon or Nikon, but there are many more uh, th uh, third-party ones out there like Rokinon. They're very well known for being a little more affordable, but almost as good as quality. So I have a 24 millimeter uh, Rokinon. You'll see an image I took of the Milky Way with it later, and it's a really nice lens. So uh, Rokinon makes some pretty good stuff too. So you can, 
you can save yourself a little bit of money and not buy the uh, name brand ones like, you know, Canon or Nikon or something like that. And, of course, to do tripod astrophotography, you need a tripod. Uh, of course, any regular photo, video tripod w will do. I have a reasonably portable M Monfrotto tripod, which I like very much. But Oban also makes very good tripods. Uh, but, you know, with the, the lighter mirrorless cameras, even, even lesser tripods will do at first because they are, they are a bit lighter. Now, back in the old 35 millimeter days, we had what was called a cable release, uh, but now there's digital versions of this, and the digital version of the cable release is called a remote switch. So instead of using the uh, shutter button on the camera, which can move the camera and distort your stars, because again, those digital cameras are very sensitive, you can use a remote switch that plugs into the side of your camera, and you just press the little button to open the shutter. Or if you want to program a whole series of images and just sit back and watch it go, you can get yourself an intervalometer or a remote timer. So these can be programmed. Uh, Canon and Nikon do have their own. The version from Canon I know costs like 150 bucks, but there are even uh, wireless ones like this one uh, that come highly praised. This specific one here, I can't read the specific brand. I didn't make, make a note of it, uh, but you can do a search for best intervalometers for astrophotography, and you might find the article from space.com. And this wireless one here is the one they recommend uh, above all. So you can get rid of the cables, and you can use a wireless version nowadays as well. So to do tripod astrophotography, here are just some uh, simple tips and steps to take. Number one, when you have all the equipment uh, together and it's all set up and ready to go, just make sure your tripod is reasonably level. It doesn't have to be perfect. Don't obsess over the little bubble level being right in the center of the circle, but you want it to be, you know, reasonably level. And then you want to have the following camera settings. Above all else, make sure your camera is on the raw setting or the equivalent version. Some other cameras call it something different. But in Canon, Nikon, it's called the raw setting. And this gives you the most flexibility later on with processing. Don't lose uh, precious data by saving it as a JPEG. I mean, if you want, you can save it as raw and JPEG. But, you know, I don't know why. Uh, you, you definitely want to save it as raw. Have it as raw. And then make sure your camera is set on the bulb or manual setting, unless you're going to keep your exposures under 30 seconds, because most uh, most digital cameras you can uh, uh, program or set up to 30 seconds in exposure. Uh, so that makes it a little easier. But um, if you're going to go longer than 30 seconds, then you definitely want to be on the bulb or manual setting. And make sure your balance is set to daylight. I've, I've compared it, I've compared uh, the setting here to the the balance setting to uh, auto and daylight. Daylight does give a little bit brighter image, so it does make a slight difference. So make sure your camera is set to daylight. And this rule can be broken uh, because digital cameras, DSLRs, DSLMs, they're the, the noise level is getting so good now uh, that you can go beyond ISO uh, 1600. So obviously, the higher the ISO, the more sensitive the camera becomes. So it's like using faster film back in the old film days. But you can start around 400 to 1600. But you can try. I, uh, I've seen plenty of shots in the 3,200, 4,000 ISO range. Just remember, though, the, the higher the ISO, the more noisy uh, the image gets. And make sure your lens is set to manual focus. There are some, there's at least one lens I own where you turn that thing right to infinity and it's in focus. Uh, but most lenses aren't like that. Most lenses don't focus right at infinity for astronomy. So make sure you check. The great thing is you get instant feedback on your screen. You, you can turn on the live view, um, you know, zoom into a star, and you can get that focus really, really tight. Um, but don't trust the autofocus for any for most forms of astrophotography. Maybe on the moon close up, uh, you might get that to work, but otherwise, not so much. You want to make sure the focus is on manual. And 
unless you got a really good lens, you know, a really expensive f2 lens, you want to keep the lens's focal ratio between f2.8 and f4. Uh, if it's kind of a lower quality lens, then you do want to stop it down to about f4 or so. Your exposures will have to be a bit longer, but you'll avoid getting distortions of stars on the edge of the field there. Because, um, you know, stars are the most strictest of uh, optic testers. And as I mentioned, focus on a bright star. It's so much easier today. You know, back in the film days, you just took your chances, really. Uh, some of it was experience later on, but early on when you're just getting started, you just kind of hope for the best. And sometimes it just didn't work out. But today, you can focus on a bright star with the live screen. And uh, most cameras at least have a, a, a 10 times zoom. Uh, there's a mirrorless uh, camera from Canon that's designed for astrophotography and that goes up to a 30 zoom which is even more important or critical to get you a good focus and then of course frame your shot you can you know look through the optical viewfinder with a dslr or the you know the the digital viewfinder through through a mirrorless camera uh but what what i often do is when i do want to take like a picture of the milky way for example i just uh, take a really short exposure at a high ISO. It might look really noisy and really icky, but it shows you how your framing is. Because today you have, you know, maybe like a 128 gigabyte storage card. You have thousands of and thousands of images that you can take, even in the raw setting. So why not just sacrifice a few shots from your camera, uh, check in to see how the framing actually looks on the screen as opposed to the viewfinder. And then go ahead and take exposures between 10 and 30 seconds. Now, if you are going to image uh, the Milky Way or do constellation photography and you want relatively pinpoint stars, then you want to follow what's called the 500 rule. So with the 500 rule, uh, the maximum exposure you can take in seconds with no trailed stars is 500 hence the name, divided by the focal length of your lens, which is always in millimeters. So that'll give you usually something between 10 and 30 seconds, maybe a little bit longer for a really wide angle um, lens, but usually the 500 rule works pretty well. There is a version of the 500 rule for crop sensor um, cameras, but uh, I just show the basic version here because again, you have thousands of images that you can do on your storage card you know, go ahead and sacrifice some and, and you'll learn by trial and error too because there's no better teacher than making mistakes. And frankly, if you don't like making mistakes, then astrophotography is not for you because I've made some humdingers over the years and I'm sure many others that have shot the sky out there as well have. Uh, so that, that what, that's what teaches you the best. And then finally, number six, make sure you expose to the right. Usually when you take your picture, you have that nice big preview on the screen, but you want to cycle through the different uh, view modes on the uh, back screen of your camera and look at the histogram. So this little curve here, this little graph is called the histogram. And if this curve is crammed against the left, you know, just really bashed against the left side of the histogram, then your exposure was too short. So quite often with all forms of astrophotography, really, the sweet spot of the histogram is to have the curve right about there where you see it on the screen there. Because if you expose just right, that gives you the most power to process it later. So just follow these uh, six basic steps and you'll be able to begin taking a uh, very simple but very nice tripod astrophotography. We've been showing astrophotos in our club, the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, for years. And believe me, the ones that get the most oohs and ahs are regular nightscapes that you do with an ordinary tripod. People do love the deep sky stuff, close-ups of galaxies, but it's scenic shots of the Milky Way and Aurora that really gets the, the regular folks excited. They really like that stuff. So here's just some uh, a sample of how powerful digital cameras are today. On the right is an old-fashioned film image. I'm very certain 
This image that I took here is the only film shot left in the lecture. This is it. This uh, was taken from the 2001 Texas Star Party, the first time I ever went. Uh, May 17th, 2001, I used Kodak LE400 film. That was pretty good stuff back in the day. Kodak Law Enforcement 400. That's what the LE stood for. And this is a 60-minute exposure. One hour. Piggybacked. Uh, on my 10 inch LX200 using a 28 millimeter lens at f4. So, this is one hour. This image, as you can see, taken from the Okitech Star Party with my uh, old 550D or T2i with a 24 millimeter lens, is 25 seconds at ISO 6400. So this breaks the ISO rule that I kind of set earlier. So it's not really a rule. It's more like a guideline. So it's just, it just shows how powerful, uh, how much more powerful digital cameras are compared to the old film cameras. So good riddance film. Now, I would love to show you nothing but my images, but I'm my worst critic. So what I've done here through much of the lecture is pick out astrophotos online uh, that I personally really enjoy. And if you do have the notes, the companion notes to the series, if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, the notes are available in the video description. Uh, but anyone that registered should have a link to the notes. Uh, there are links to all the images I'm going to show you here today. Uh, so if you're wondering where this image came from, how, how can you find it to learn more? Um, that's where. So, so on the back of the notes, there, there are links to all these images, and they should all be good links. I just checked them recently. So I really like this one. This is during a star party in Greece, and I just found this online one day. So this is basically Ursa Major, or the Big Dipper, above Mar Mount Parnon in Greece, taken with a 500D, or a T1i. And you can see he used a zoom lens, 17 to 50 millimeters, set at 50 millimeter, but f2.8. And this is only 30 seconds on a stationary tripod at ISO 3200. So again, we've exceeded the 1600 rule there. And you notice the, the bright stars in the Big Dipper have spikes. He used an artificial program called like star spikes to create those. You can put a, a cross wires in front of the lens, but... There are plenty of uh, like Photoshop actions you can buy or something like that to generate artificial star spikes for, you know, the artistic look here. And here's just a simple shot of the constellation Orion the Hunter with a Nikon D750 and a Nikkor 58 millimeter lens at F2. And to give the stars kind of this bloated appearance where it really makes it stand out and you can see the colors, he used a, a, a Kenko Soft On Spec A filter. So this filter adds the soft effects on your regular photographs uh, without affecting the sharpest. But for astrophotos, it kind of bloats up the uh, bright stars a bit that really accents the constellation here. So it really makes Orion pop. But you can see the fainter stars are still pretty sharp. And, you know, you can see the Orion Nebula there. So again, just four seconds at ISO 4000. And a really great thing about... Uh, Tripod astrophotography is if you have a nice foreground, there's a good chance you can get yourself uh, featured on websites like spaceweather.com. I've had a, a, a few images over the years featured on space weather, but I've never had an astronomy picture of the day, even though the guy that does the site mainly lives in Michigan, but I guess he isn't biased toward Michiganders. Uh, but this image was featured on APOD. Uh, on June 26, 2014, and we've had uh, one of the APOD guys speak to us before, and he says the key to get getting featured on APOD, uh, at least with images like this, and even on Space Weather, is to have a nice foreground. So we have this pier in the foreground with the Moon-Venus conjunction here, which is what the same DSLR I currently have, a Canon 6D. Uh, with a 70 millimeter lens, and it's only a one second exposure at ISO 640, because with bright scenes like this, you don't need to keep the ISO terribly high. You, know, you want to keep it low to keep that noise down. But in this case, to what got him that A pod is the foreground, because it really helps the image. And so, if you live in a really scenic area, uh, you can take images like this with a mountain. 
in the foreground here. So here is a 22 degree moon halo. So moon halos are caused when moonlight uh, refracts off ice crystals in a thin veil of cirrus clouds. And sure enough, you can see uh, there were some thin cirrus clouds that made the moon uh, halo possible here. And this is with a Nikon D5000 and a, a Wallamex uh, 8 millimeter fisheye lens at uh, f5.6 and 20, 25 seconds to ISO 400. So very wide field. You can basically see the entire winter hexagon in here with the big bright moon and that halo there. So just a beautiful shot, but it's the foreground that really makes it uh, pop there. Now, I would love to be able to take images like this, but I'd have to travel to Chile. This is a sun pillar at Cerro Paranal, the observatory down there in Chile. So we, ha we have the nice sun pillar here and very similar to moon halos, sun pillars develop as a result of ice crystals slowly falling through the air, reflecting sun rays off of them. So you basically get this vertical shaft of light. But again, what really makes the image is, you know, the scenic sunset, but the the cool observatories in the foreground there. But again, this shot is very doable with your standard tripod and camera. You just have to be at a place with a very scenic uh, uh, foreground. It really does help. Now, this is a remarkable image. Uh, if this one isn't in textbooks, it should be because all the uh, uh, kind of effects shown here are very rare to see at once. So, uh, this is just a rare solar halo taken with a Canon EOS 5D Mark III and, and a Samyang, kind of the same family as the Rokinon cameras, uh, 24 millimeter, an F10 for high contrast, uh, just 1 250th of a second ISO 100. And here we have, again, like with the moon, a 22 degree sun halo this time. We have a sun dog. We have a sun pillar. We have an upper tangent arm and circumzenithal arcs. So all these patterns are generated as sunlight is reflected and refracted in flat six-sided water ice crystals. And it's very rare to get all these features together. So you don't see this image very much, but if you've got a camera, tripod, and you're in the right place at the right time, you can take simple images like this. Very easy to do. Everyone tries to get the green flash. I've been trying to get it from the shore of Lake Michigan for years, but I don't know, Michigan's not maybe the best place for that. So this is probably taken somewhere on the Pacific or Atlantic coast. And so here we have a Canon EOS 7D with a 300 millimeter um, lens. So a lot longer lens than you can usually use for tripod astrophotography, but we have a bright subject. So it, it's only one eight hundredth of a second in ISO 400. So you get the green flash because the atmosphere causes the light from the sun to separate or refract into its different wavelengths. So you briefly get the green flash there. But in this case, they got a double green flash. And again, that happens very fast. You can also capture the International Space Station pass over your house. It's very nice when it does so over the Roman Forum because it, it does make for a very scenic foreground. So this is with a Canon uh, 5D Mark IV with a fairly wide angle lens, a 16 millimeter F, set of F4. And this time you can see it's not a single exposure like all the ones we've seen so far because if you take a single exposure of the space station passing through the field, especially with the, the bright foreground, it would become greatly overexposed. So what this person did is they took 11 10 second exposures and stacked them together. That's why you get the gaps with the space station there. It's not like it suddenly winked out once in a while. Those are the gaps between the exposures. Now, this person here, uh, was taking a time-lapse uh, video of the Milky Way. He was taking many images for, for a later time-lapse video, but during the course of the images, he captured a nice uh, belide that left a persistent train. If you ever go to the website and uh, look at his uh, little blog about uh, doing this one night. So here we have a Canon EOS uh, 6D Mark II with a Canon 24 millimeter lens. A uh, very good lens, so it's set at f2.5 and only eight seconds at ISO 3200. But you might get the Milky Way, but it, 
you just get lucky getting the belide, but sometimes that does happen. Now here we have the zodiacal light at La Silla Observatory, also in Chile. And this is basically uh, sunlight reflecting off dust in the plane of the solar system. It was often said the, the dust is from asteroids and comets and impacts from you know small smaller objects and micrometeorites. Uh, but now there's another idea that suggests the dust is actually from Mars. But one way or the other, it's dust uh, reflecting sunlight in the plane of the solar system. So you see the zodiacal light uh, really just from very dark sites. Um, you know, you see it listed in sky and telescope, like look for the zodiacal light on this night. And I'm always thinking, yeah, right, not from around here. But if you do live under, under very dark skies and see this weird shaft coming from the direction of the sunset, that is the zodiacal light. It can linger on for a while. And if you're under really dark skies, it can be a little annoying. So um, this is a, a nice shot here of the zodiacal light, much brighter than the images I took of it. So this is with a Nikon D700 with a 14 millimeter lens at f2.8 because it is a pretty large scale uh, feature. So you do need a pretty wide angle lens to really capture it. And this time you can see it's uh, basically three minutes uh, ISO 1600. So this may be tracked. Uh, here. So maybe technically this shouldn't be in the tripod uh, uh, section here, but it's a really cool shot. And you can take images like this with just a stationary tripod. And every 10 years, you might get a bright comet. Here's Comet McNaught, which put on a fantastic show in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, most of us in the Northern Hemisphere really never got to see it because it was at its best in January, where we never see the sky around here. So uh, according to the astrophotographer here, Gordon Garad, uh, the, the, the comet very much looked like this to the unaided eye. So uh, allegedly, this really captures how the comet really looked, if you could see it, uh, lo lo low on the horizon here. So just a Nikon D200 with a Sigma 20 millimeter lens at f1.8. And he took uh, two shots, a 30 second and 64 second shot, and combined them together. Obviously, as we record this, it's March 9th, 2024, so we are now less than one month away from the great North American eclipse. So this image will be of high interest here. This is an eclipse in 2019 over La Silla Observatory. So this was taken with a Sony camera. Uh, there are getting more popular because some of the Sony cameras have very little noise uh, and you can go to fairly high ISOs. But this one's only at ISO 100 for a one third of a second exposure with a 24 millimeter lens at F4. So if you do want to capture something like this on April 8th, 2024, you might not get the foreground with the observatories, but you can still get a nice foreground. Maybe your friends or family watching the eclipse with the with the uh, eclipsed uh, sun overhead there. And so again, just one third of a second, ISO 100. And you can see this funny feature here, fill in the screen on this side. That is, of course, the shadow of the moon. We're getting towards solar maximum. So getting shots like this from lower latitudes may become a little more commonplace here soon. At least I hope so. Uh, but here's some morning aurora from Alaska with a Nikon D850, a 14 millimeter lens. Sometimes the aurora takes up much of the sky. So you want as wide a lens as you can get sometimes. And this is only four seconds at ISO 2500. And remember back in part two, I showed you a video of Aurora in real time uh, taken with like a Sony camera. Cause again, they're very low noise at high ISOs and you can do real time Aurora video as well. But th obviously this is a still shot here. Now star trails, this is where you want to ignore the 500 rule and you can really exceed uh, the minimum length to avoid uh, getting trailed stars. Cause with star trails, you want trailed stars. So here we have in the foreground, some nice petroglyphs with star trails in the background, taken with a Canon EOS 6D, the same camera I currently own, even though you know it's getting a little dated now. And this is with a Canon uh, EFS 10 to 22 uh, zoom lens set at 10 millimeters, F4. So 
this is two shots combined together later in Photoshop, most likely. So he took 74 minute shots for a total of 4.7 hours at ISO 400. And he took 30, 30 second shots for the foreground because using Photoshop, you can isolate the foreground and the background and combine them, combine the separate images later to get a very well eliminated and noise free foreground and a very clean background for the star trails. So back in the film days, you basically just tried to take one exposure. Maybe it lasted uh, 30 minutes. If you tried doing something four hours and some animal bumps your tripod or you bump your tripod or some annoying bright plane flies through, your entire exposure could be ruined. But with digital, you might just be able to throw out one of the pictures where uh, maybe a, a plane fl flew through or something like that. And to create the star trails from many images combined together, there are freeware available called either star trails or star stacks that allow you to, uh, that help you process the images. You know, it, it's very easy today. Just get the right bit of software and it does a lot of the hard work for you. All right, so there's a lot to do with an ordinary camera and tripod, but eventually you're gonna wanna take longer exposures and that's where you can begin to venture into piggyback astrophotography. So quite often with piggyback astrophotography, your camera rides on top of the telescope. So here we have a DSLR on top of a Schmidt Cassegrain and these uh, camera adapters uh, are widely available for Mead and Celestron Schmidt Cassegrains. You can do the same thing with refractors, uh, but you might need a short little uh, dovetail and a, and a different type of camera adapter, but it's not much more uh, in, in depth with equipment needs. So if you do have a telescope already, you can do piggyback astrophotography. So to do this guided wide field imaging, here's what you need. I already mentioned you need the piggyback mount. There are versions available for both uh, Schmidt Cassegrains and you'll want a, a, a version like this for either you, your Newtonian or your refractor. This one here can be you know panned up and down. Some are fixed. This one, you can adjust the uh, uh, tilt angle there. And you wanna get it on a, a dovetail plate for. Newtonians and refractors. So dovetail plates are widely available from companies like Los Mandy or ADM Accessories. I purchased from both. They're very, they're both very good quality. Um, there's no real advantage to either one. They're both good. If you do uh, use your camera with a heavier telephoto lens, uh, you might want some kind of counterweight. Um, this is the type to use for a Schmidt Cassegrain. For your standard German equatorial mount, uh, you just might need to buy an additional counterweight or just readjust the position of the counterweight, you know, slide it a little further down the counterweight shaft uh, to make sure the system is balanced. And if you do have a pretty big telephoto lens where a standard camera adapter won't work or even a small refractor riding on top, you want to get yourself some mounting rings. And again, these are available from Los Mandy or ADM Accessories. You'll absolutely need a T-ring camera if you uh, do use a piggyback telescope on your bigger telescope. So a T-ring will allow you to adapt your camera to any telescope. So there are T-rings available for all camera types, Canon, Nikon, Sony, whatever. And these can be purchased for maybe 20, 30 bucks at any camera store or any telescope dealer uh, would have T-rings for specific cameras in stock as well. So the T-ring clamps on your camera in place of the lens, and then you need a T-adapter. So there are T-adapters for Schmidt Cassegrains like this one. And there are T-adapters that work on any rack and pinion focuser or Crayford focuser, like with refractors or Newtonians. So these uh, slide in where the eyepiece goes, but these uh, thread on the back for, for a Schmidt Cassegrain. Of course, if you have a rack and pinion focuser on your Schmidt Cassegrain, then you can use one of these as well. And because you can use longer telephoto lenses for piggyback astrophotography, there are a wide variety of very nice telephoto lenses out there. And you know, 60 millimeters always seemed a little short for telephoto to me, but 
quite often they say it starts around 60 millimeters, you know, beyond 50, up to 400 millimeters or more. But when you do get up to these really long focal length telephoto lenses, it's really cheaper to buy a small refracting telescope. And they're really just as good. Um, but if you do have a really nice telephoto lens already, maybe you do sports photography or something, uh, you can use it for that as well. But a refractor is a lot cheaper. So here are some examples of piggyback astrophotography. So here we have Comet Lemon, 47 Tucana, very famous globular cluster that I've never seen. And this big feature here is the small Magellanic Cloud, one of the satellite galaxies to the Milky Way. So three, three cool uh, features for the price of one. This is taken with a Canon 1000D and a Vivitar 135 millimeter zoom lens set at f6.3. And this person did 25 minute shots for a total of you know 100 minute exposure. So I haven't quite mentioned this yet, but the reason you do 25 minute shots instead of maybe one long shot is you want to get down the noise because uh, any any photo session that you do is kind of a battle between signal and noise. Now, the noise of more modern cameras is getting better all the time, but it'll never be perfect. You'll always need to take a series of images. Whereas the, the great thing about noise, which is mainly generated, you know, from heat from your camera, is it's random. So that's why you can't just take one five-minute shot and stack it 20 times or 100 times is because if you stack one image that you've duplicated over and over again, that really brings out the noise. But because the noise is random, if you take a series of images and combine them together, that really helps level uh, lower the noise. It, it increases the signal and fights off the noise. So let's get the annoying table there out of the way. And you can appreciate this beautiful image of the comet, the globular cluster, and the galaxy. So if you don't have a telescope already, if you don't have a schmidt cassegrain or a Newtonian or a refractor on a German equatorial mount, um, you can still do uh, guided wide field imaging with longer focal length lenses or even, of course, wide field lenses with uh, trackers. The, the original tracker is a good old fashioned barn door tracker. So most trackers that we'll talk about, you know, they're several hundred dollars. They're not as expensive as German equatorial mounts or uh, harmonic mounts. So, but even if a few hundred dollars or more is a little too expensive for you, you can build a barn door tracker. Within the companion notes to this lecture, I, ha I, I do have links to a handful of barn door trackers that look pretty good. But if you just Google, you know, how to build a barn door tracker, you'll find many, many more uh, designs online. So what you do is you build your barn door tracker here. Some can be motorized, some are manually operated. Um, some you just kind of eyeball toward Polaris. This one has a uh, green laser pointer that you can use it to uh, point toward Polaris. And you can either turn the crank like every few seconds or so, every 30 seconds or a minute or so, or you can have a motor uh, slowly turn like the piano hinge for you because you have like the um, a pivot bolt here or and a piano hinge. And as it widens, you know, you can take a certain length exposure. It depends on how your barn door tracker is, is designed, but you can take up to maybe 15 minute exposures with a simple barn door tracker that might cost you just 20, 30 bucks to build. So a lot of people don't do the barn door tracker thing anymore, so it is hard to find some really good images. And here's a pretty respectable image of the Orion Nebula, uh, one of the only kind of good ones I could find online with the barn door tracker. So here we have the Orion Nebula with a Nikon D7000. Uh, and you can see it's a, a Nikkor 180 millimeter zoom lens at f2.8. And this time he did 172. 30 second shots at ISO 800 for a total of an 86 minute shot exposure, all with a barn door. And if memory serves, it was a manual version. So there you go. You, you can take longer exposures than you can with a tripod with a barn door and save a ton of money. But if you love 
beautiful mechanics uh, and maybe even want something you can set up in your living room to, just to admire, you can get yourself an Astro Track 360. So now I'll talk about these um, uh, uh, star trackers that have become widely available in the past uh, 10, 15 years or so. And one of the more expensive ones is the Astro Track 360. I mean, look at this thing. It's just a beautiful work of art. I would, again, if I could, I would set this up in my living room if I had one. It's just so beautiful. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if you just want both the uh, convenience and the beauty of the machine ship here, uh, you can get one of these. But they are ra rather expensive. Uh, but it does hold a maximum of 22 pounds or 10 kilograms. So that gives a lot of German equatorial mounts a run for its money. And here's a sample image with the Astro Trek. So here we have the Eastern Veil Nebula, NGC 6992 in the constellation Cygnus. And this was taken with the Sony Alpha 7R with a 500 millimeter Canon lens at F4.5. And with the Astro Trek, he took uh, 30 three minute shots at ISO 800. This can be a difficult region to image because of all the stars, but uh, uh, he managed them pretty well in this image here. So here, here we have one half of the famous Cygnus loop, also known as the Eastern Veil Nebula. A little more affordable than the Astro Track is Explore Scientific's iExos 100-2. Uh, it basically does look like a little German equatorial mount, and it, and it pretty much is. Uh, it has a capacity of 15 pounds or seven, seven kilograms. I really considered getting one of these for a while, but I'll show you the version, uh, the current version I have here later, the, the Star Tracker I have. So here is the Elephant Trunk Nebula taken with the Explorer Scientific iExos 100. So the Elephant Trunk Nebula is IC1396. This was taken with a uh, uh, Nikon D810A, which is one of their DSLRs meant for astrophotography. It has the standard uh, filter removed and a, a special uh, astrophotography filter built in. So in this case, we have 36 three-minute shots at ISO 1600. Again, you got to fight that noise with lots of signal. To get that signal, you take lots of images. And it, and it could be many more than 36 sometimes. Another popular star tracker is the Kenko Sky Memo. There are two for uh, two versions of the Sky Memo. There's the KS version that holds 11 pounds, and there's the smaller KT version that holds uh, 7 pounds. This is the Sky Memo uh, S here, the bigger one, and this is the Sky Memo T. So again, this one holds 11 pounds, this one holds 7 pounds, or 5, 3 five and three kilograms, respectfully. So here is the very famous Rho Ophiuchi region in the constellation Scorpius. This is Antares, the globular cluster M4, with all the uh, really different colored nebulosity nearby, makes it very photogenic. So this is with a modified Canon 6D because you can buy an off-the-shelf DSLR or DSLM you can either purchase one that's already been modified, you can send it in to have it modified, or if you're really handy, you can modify it yourself. So this replaces the internal filter meant for standard daylight imaging. There is a filter you can add to use during the day, but I would just recommend if you do this route, purchase yourself a, a dedicated uh, uh, camera that's been modified for astrophotography. So it does make them much more sen sensitive in the red end of the spectrum, which is very important in astronomy because lots of this nebulosity, <laughs> not so much here, I guess, though, is red. So here we have a uh, 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 6D modified with a 200 millimeter lens at f3.2 with the Kenko Sky Memo. And this is 210 60 second shots at ISO 1800 or, or 1600. And some people always ask, well, how do I know how to get the right exposure? You really don't. It depends on the current sky conditions. Just take a bunch of photos, maybe more than you think you need. I always take more than I usually end up using because ultimately you might have to discard some. Don't get too discouraged if a satellite f flies through the field of view because after 210 shots, uh, 
most of them shouldn't really have a satellite in it. And if, if a lot of them do, they're going in different directions. And when you stack it, uh, usually the satellites uh, will kind of cancel the uh, get get canceled out in the image uh, uh, stacking process there. So don't let that discourage you. Now I have uh, an older Ioptron Sky Tracker. Mine looks like a black box, looks like a little black rectangle, uh, but the newer versions are even better. So I know a friend of mine uh, that used a Sky Tracker Pro uh, during the 2017 eclipse, and he took some very nice images uh, with it. So here's the Sky Tra Tracker Pro that holds about 6.6 .6 pounds or three, three kilograms. And this is a shot of the Milky Way that I took. This, again, is from the Texas Star Party, uh, but this time it was at the 2016 Texas Star Party. So this is with the Canon uh, 600D uh, T3i, which uh, has been modified. I should probably make a note of that here. And I used my Rokinon 24 millimeter lens at f4. Again, with the Sky Tracker. Uh, my Sky Tracker, uh, I I bought a Teleview Telepod tripod for it. That works very well. So I just tried a whole series of exposures here. Um, you know, just one 30 second shot, 102 seconds, 120 seconds, 180 seconds to try to help bring out the dynamic range of this area a lot more. You know, it's a bit more work, but you know, just 7.2 minutes and it looks pretty good. There was kind of some haziness because this is when the Milky Way is very low, hence I call it Milky Way rising. And then a little more uh, uh, fancy is the Ioptron Sky Guider. This one holds 11 pounds or about 5 kilograms. So it's a little more robust than the Sky Tracker. And here's a sample image uh, with the Sky Guider of the large Magellanic Cloud. I showed an image earlier of the small Magellanic Cloud, so of course I have to show one of the large Magellanic Cloud. Another 6D was used for this shot with 135 millimeter zoom lens at F2. And now we have 37 two minute shots. So here's uh, another robust example, not as fancy as the AstroTrack 360, but if you like machined stuff and not so much plastic, because a lot of these do, have plastic construction, at least on the housing, uh, then you want to get yourself a Los Mandy Starlapse. And uh, because it is machined, it's much more robust. This thing holds up to 30 pounds or 13.6 kilograms. So here's a sample image of the Pleiades taken with the Los Mandy Starlapse. So a, a Canon 5D Mark II, 700 to 200 millimeter zoom lens set at 200 millimeters and F5.6 with 21 five-minute exposures at ISO 1600. Now, uh, Skywatcher has the Star Adventure series. The first one is the TI. Uh, the, the TI holds about 11 pounds. And uh, a lot newer is the GTI. And this is the one that I currently own. This is my current Sky Tracker, but and really, every respect, this is just a, a really small, portable German equatorial mount. Most sky trackers only track in right ascension, which is, you know, the, the stars move in right ascension. But this one will track in right ascension, declination, has an auto guider port. It's fully go to, and it's very affordable with the. Uh, I believe with the tripod I got, I got a carbon fiber tripod, not the the standard aluminum version. Um, I, I don't have this, but the, uh, I don't have the little pier here, but the tripod I do have gets pretty tall. And uh, it was only about $700 for the entire thing. So if you're looking for a very portable Star Tracker slash German equatorial mount, I highly recommend this one. Like the TI, it only holds about 11 pounds. Some people were disappointed by that. They thought uh, this bit newer, fancier version would hold a little bit more weight, but uh, for me, it's perfect. Not only can you use wide field lenses, telephoto lenses, but this can hold small refractors in like the 60 millimeter to 70 millimeter range. I plan on getting myself a Sharp Star 61 millimeter refractor in the near future uh, to put on this thing. I already have the ASI Air Pro. Uh, I just recently got a ZWO Auto Guider to, to just have my really portable setup using this mount. 
So I don't have a shot with the GTI, but I do have an example with the TI, which is very similar. It's just not go-to. So this is by Alan Dyer, uh, who, who wrote the book on this type of astrophotography, literally. So here we have the Cygnus Lyra region with the North America nebula. This is with the Canon 5D Mark II. I believe it was modified, but I'm not really sure about that. With just your standard 50 millimeter lens on a, a Star Adventure uh, TI. I got to put the TI in there because when I first put this together, there was only that one. So this is five 10 minute shots at ISO 800. And uh, the folks from Vixen are the one that started this craze with Star Trackers. Uh, their most recent version is the Polari U, which holds 5.5 pounds or 2.5 kilograms. And this thing can be converted or you know, reconfigured to use it for uh, pans and time-lapse imaging. So, you know, the uh, uh, base here turns and as you're taking exposures, you can just kind of pan across the sky to maybe capture the rising Milky Way or just some rising constellation. So that makes it really versatile. So here we have another comet. This time it's Comet Lovejoy Q2, the Pleiades, M45, and NGC 1499, the California Nebula. And this is with the Vixen uh, GP2 photo guider. And uh, you can see it's with the 5D Mark II, 85 millimeter lens at f2.8, uh, 33 three minute shots at ISO 1600. So just another comet that just was passing through the sky. And here is the one that started it all. This is the Vixen Polari Star Tracker. This was the first one to come out, I think, around 2009, 2010 or so. And this really uh, brought about the Star Tracker craze because uh, I'm sure there are ones I'm missing here, but there are no shortage of Star Trackers available. So this one looks very much like the uh, original version of the Ioptron Sky Tracker, but it's, it's white instead of black. And it holds about 11, uh, or not 11, but 7 pounds or 3.2 kilograms, but it is very portable. And you can take shots like this with it. So here's a wider field of the Rho Ophiuchi region. So we have Antares, M4, and this is the, uh, I believe that's the Pipe Nebula in the Milky Way. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Now we're going to move in to the ultimate form of astrophotography, and that is prime focus deep sky astrophotography. Uh, so we're kind of catching up to my limit of knowledge here because this is the area where I'm still getting uh, better and better, or at least trying to. So you can do prime focus deep sky astrophotography with a DSLR or DSLM. I know like, for example, Alan Dyer, he's really in to using his camera for astrophotography. He, he doesn't use anything else but his DSLR or DSLM camera. But of course, many astrophotographers are now getting into the uh, cooled uh, either CCD cameras, which are becoming more and more extinct, or the cooled CMOS dedicated astrophotography cameras uh, because there have been uh, really good quality uh, Chinese imports that, that have made these uh, more popular than ever. So chief among those is the ones from ZWO. I hear some people pronounce it ZWO or ZWO, but I always say ZWO. I don't know how others, I don't know the technical way it's supposed to be said, but I say ZWO. So Here's most of their current cameras. I couldn't quite squeeze all of them in here unless I got rid of the pretty pictures on the side, but I didn't want to do that. Uh, so if you're looking for one to start with, uh, there's a couple I would recommend. Uh, there's the ASI 071. This is the one we currently use in Owl Observatory at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. And uh, that camera has produced some very nice images for me. Uh, but another very popular one, is the ASI 294. Uh, the, one of the reasons why this is a very popular camera is it has a very high quantum efficiency. So quantum efficiency is the measure of the effectiveness of an imaging device to convert incident photons into electrons. You know, so for example, 
if a sensor had a quantum efficiency of 100 uh, and was exposed to 100 photons, it would produce 100 electrons of signal. So the higher the quantum efficiency, uh, the, the more kind of sensitive the imaging sensor is. So the ASI 294 is basically around $1,000 or so, uh, which is extremely affordable for a dedicated astrophotography camera. And they can be thermal electrically cooled. So the, the sensor can be cooled as much as minus 20, 20 degrees uh, Celsius. I know it says minus 35, but with their kind of uh, lower grade electronics than you find on the more expensive cameras, it ain't, it ain't no way you're going to get the minus 35. In the summer, it's hard enough to get these things cooled to minus 20 degrees uh, Celsius. But you, you can usually get them cooled to minus 10 degrees Celsius. But with the way the noise level is going down with the newer cameras, uh, that's usually pretty sufficient. So, so minus 10 with the less noisier cameras is just fine. And of course, they do have some pretty sophisticated ones. Uh, there's the ASI 6200, which is full frame. So it has a 36 by 24 millimeter uh, CMOS sensor. And then you even see this big honking thing here that has nearly 12,000 by 8,800 pixels. This is a medium format camera, uh, but you got to have a really good optics to take in this entire uh, field here. But uh, some telescopes and uh, do claim to be able to handle that uh, up to sensors of this size, but it is very expensive. I think this is roughly around a $12,000 camera. Uh, so that one's pretty pricey. This full frame one, uh, the ASI 6200, I think that's only around $4,000 or so. So again, for a full frame dedicated astronomy camera, that's a steal. Uh, a little more uh, popular with some of the more dedicated imagers are the ones from QHY CCD. They'll probably drop the CCD part, I'm, I'm guessing, if they haven't already. Um, so this is their current line of cameras. I even had to remove a column from the previous version of the lecture here. So this appears to be all of them. And during the past two years that I've done this lecture, uh, from the last time I did this lecture, they've really changed a lot of, of their cameras. So they keep constantly changing and improving their cameras. They do have a medium format one. They got the 461. Um, so really another really big chip there. But they do have the 600 that's uh, full frame. Um, but some of these, like the 294, again, are very popular, um, or even, the, you know, so some of these do have pretty good quantum efficiency. But I, I've seen images uh, from these from some of our members, and boy, are they just incredibly noise-free. Uh, you know, j just the, the single image that the cameras take are, are just fantastic. So, of course, the, 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 these can be purchased, uh, uh, many of them can be purchased as one-shot color cameras, but to really get the most out of your camera and the, the sharpest images, you're going to want to eventually move into different types of filters, because monochrome cameras with, uh, you know, a clear luminance and uh, red, green, blue filters, when you take them, take the images through the separate filters, it gives you even sharper images than a dedicated one-shot color camera. So there are the really expensive ones from Astrodon. We use Astrodon filters on our remote telescope in Arizona. And with the narrowband filters like hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two, uh, we, we had to get the 50 millimeter square unmelted filters. And back when we bought ours, they were 1200 bucks a filter. Uh, so the narrowband filters can be pretty expensive. Uh, at least from Astrodon, but there are a lot more affordable alternatives today. Uh, I know some folks, uh, even members that have the Antlia line of filters, and they swear by them, they love them a lot, and, and they are much more reasonable for the LRGB filters and the narrowband filters. Uh, there's also a Astronomic, uh, Better Planetarium, of course, has their line. They basically have filters for everything, and even Chroma offers filters. So don't just go to Astrodon, get repulsed by the price and move on. You know, do look for alternatives out there uh, to save you money. 
So here's what you can use for wide field uh, telescopes, because if you are going to work your way up to prime focused astrophotography with a telescope and maybe a star tracker, but most likely a German equatorial mount, I highly recommend starting with a wide field refractor. Do not buy like an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain and think you're, you're, you're going to become the next great astrophotographer with it. You want to start small because wide field refractors are more forgiving um, in terms of polar alignment and focus and stuff like that. So absolutely start with a short focal length, small aperture refractor. And there are many, many options available out there. So here are just a few. If I miss your favorite, I am sorry. So there's Astrotech. Those are kind of the, the more affordable brand of wide field refractors. They do, of course, have longer focal length ones, like the big one toward the bottom there. But they do make a nice series of uh, very short focal length, small aperture refractors that hardly weigh anything. So you don't need a really bulky mount to support it. Orion telescopes and binoculars, of course, have their own line. Some of these may no longer be produced. I don't update the images here every time. So if you're thinking, oh, one of these is no longer made, it's very likely, but uh, I'm not going to mention specific models here for the most part. But again, Astrotech and Orion make very nice scopes. Uh, with Astrotech, they do have uh, refractors between 60 millimeters and 152 millimeters, which is about six inches. Orion has refractors in the roughly 70 millimeter to 130 millimeter range. But again, start with the 60s and 70s. Don't get too much bigger than that. Um, if you want to spend a bit more, and again, love craftsmanship as well as good optical uh, performance, then Teleview is the way to go. They make very robust equipment with great optics. And you just got to support Uncle Al one way or the other. So uh, Teleview has everything from a 60 millimeter up to 127 millimeter. And again, they are built like tanks. They are very robust and just well made uh, in terms of optical quality and craftsmanship. Sharp Star has some nice ones. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that along with my uh, Star Adventure GTI, I wanted to get a Sharp Star 61 millimeter is the successor to this telescope here. The the Sharp Star 61 millimeter, it's only about $500, but you have to spend a couple of hundred dollars more to get the focal reducer. And I highly recommend you get the focal reducer if you get the telescope. That makes it even faster and the image is even sharper. So Sharp Star, uh, again, they're uh, made in China, but they have very nice refractors in the 61 millimeter to 140 millimeter range. Then there's William, uh, then there's uh, Stellar View. Stellar View has again small refractors in roughly the 70 millimeter range, up to six or seven inches. My largest uh, refractor is a five inch Stellar View. Uh, you'll see a little image of it uh, later. I, I I bought my five inch Stellar View specifically for the eclipse in 2017, and I still have it, and I'm going to use it again for the eclipse in 2024 here pretty soon. Then there's William Optics. They have the very popular uh, Red Cat telescopes. Uh, they do have helical focusers, which personally I'm not a fan of, but I've seen some really nice images with the two Red Cat telescopes. They do have a 50, 51 millimeter, I think, and they have a 71 millimeter Red Cat. They're pricey, but they are very nice, well-built telescopes. And they do have others available with your standard Crayford or uh, rack and pinion focusers. So Will William Optics has them in the kind of 51 millimeter to 156 millimeter uh, range. But again, start small. So here's one of my images again. I don't share too many, but I like this one. So here we have the Lagoon Nebula on the left and the Triffid Nebula on the right. North is at the uh, right here. I tilt it so I can make the image here a little bit bigger. This was taken at the 2016, yeah, the 2016 Texas Star Party. This is with my modified Canon 600D T3i with my old uh, uh, TMB, my Thomas M. Back 92 millimeter SS refractor. I had to sell that refractor to get my stellar view. 
I wish I didn't have to do it. I regret it because uh, this TNB-92 gave the most perfect star test I have ever seen. My God, were the optics good on that thing. They still are. Uh, a member owns it, and one of these days I'm going to try to buy it back from them. He better sell it to me at a discount, too. <laughs> and so uh, that scope was on my Astrophysics Mach 1 GTO. Uh, very nice German equatorial mount. I finally gave up with the Mead Celestron variety and went uh, something where I didn't waste too much time under the stars. Uh, so the Mach 1's been very nice to me. I've never lost an image with the Mach 1 through guiding errors or whatever. So you can see uh, the Lagoon Nebula is very dynamic in its brightness range. So I took a whole series of images to help bring that out under the dark skies of the Texas Star Party. And it's only 51 minutes total. I could have easily, you know, you could easily do a couple hours to really make this thing come out. But, you know, under those dark Texas skies, it really pops. Here's one from Pete Mumbauer. This is the Andromeda Galaxy M31. This was taken with the CCD, which again, they are on their way out. CCDs are being replaced with CMOS cameras. Uh, their main advantage is they are cheaper. Uh, but because a lot more effort has been put into CMOS technology, because that's what they use in DSLRs, DSLMs, uh, the, the noise re uh, reduction is a lot better. Uh, the noise level of CMOS cameras today is a lot better than CCD cameras. Um, if they kept developing CCD technology, they would probably catch up. But uh, because CMOSs are cheaper to make, they've been abandoned. So this is taken with one of those sharp stars, the previous version. Uh, but when he purchased this, the optics weren't perfect and the company knew it. So they sent him a new optical um, section of the telescope. So it's basically the, the latest version uh, that they sent him for free. And so, of course, he used the uh, 8, uh, 0.8x uh, field flattener focal reducer on his uh, Astrophysics 1100. So um, I'm very certain the uh, scope was writing piggyback on his larger Newtonian because, uh, sure, you could put the sharp star on the Astrophysics, but, uh, boy, that would be hard to balance. So you can see uh, the Andromeda Galaxy has a very vast array of brightnesses. So just a whole bunch of exposures to really help bring that out. Some people are saying the CMOS cameras are getting so good and so sensitive, you don't even need the luminance uh, exposure anymore. A lot of people are just starting to do RGB and not luminance anymore. So that does save you a little bit of time. Just take a bunch of color. So yeah, th this is a staggering 14 hours and 10 minutes. So you can get really dedicated in these projects. Here's one from another member, uh, our, our, our father-son duo, uh, Dave and Matt Garden. This is the Elephant Trunk Nebula. Uh, Dave, who is mainly taking the images these days, Matt has to work too much, unfortunately. Um, he mainly focuses in the narrowband region because he does a lot of his imaging from a light-polluted Portage, Michigan. And so if you focus in the narrowband region from light-polluted areas, it, it, it does... Uh, make it easier to take images like this. But he does have some dark skies up in the Huron-Manistee National Forest as well. So this is with his full-frame ZWO ASI 6200mm, a monochrome camera. And Dave has a Takahashi FSQ-106 EDX3. We also have a, a similar Takahashi, in fact, the exact same Takahashi camera on our remote telescope, but Dave's has the flattest field of any refractor I have ever seen. Our Takahashi, not so much. We currently had to send it in uh, to get some work done on it, so hopefully the image performance is a lot better because some Takahashis aren't quite up to snuff sometimes, so let that be a forewarning for you. If, if you do try to go big and buy a Takahashi refractor, try to check it right away. And if you don't like the collimation, send it back. So Dave has an old school G11. And you can see he did use those narrowband filters, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two. And this is 4.5 hours of the elephant trunk nebula. So that's probably Dave's best shot to date. So if you do wanna have a little more aperture, but still something fairly portable, you can get yourself a Newtonian reflector. So uh, Astrotech has a series of these. I have the 8-inch F4 Astrotech, uh, the Crayford Focuser, 
is basically junk. <laughs> um, I upgraded that pretty quick to a manual moonlight focuser, but unfortunately, you can't get the manual moonlight focusers anymore. Uh, you have to get just the motorized ones, so I'm glad I got my moonlight when I did. Although the motorized are very nice. And one of these days, I might replace the aluminum tube with a carbon fiber tube. Uh, but they do have carbon fiber truss designs as well. They are a little more expensive. Uh, most are a little bigger, but Astrotech has these uh, scopes in the 6 to 12 inch range. Um, so here's the little 6 inch. So that's, you know, it's very light. Um, and, and, and that could be supported on a small German equatorial mount. I don't think a Star Tracker. Uh, could handle this. It's probably pushing the limit of, of the weight capacity of those little things. Then Orion does have some. They're very similar to the Astrotech ones. They're probably <laughs> often made in the same place. Uh, but uh, Orion has them in the 6 to 10 inch range as well. Again, these may not be, be some of the current line that they have, but they do have uh, uh, some nice Newtonians in the 6 to 10 inch range. Uh, Sharp Star, they, not only do they make uh, nice refractors, they have a uh, nice carbon fiber um, tube Newtonians that are very fast. They have 130 millimeter, that's an F2.8. They have 150 millimeter, that's F2.8. And they have a 200 millimeter, that's an F3.8. Uh, so because they are carbon fiber, they have and they have very nice uh, rack and pinion focusers, they probably are, you know, more expensive than the Orions or the Astrotechs, but they are good quality. Even though they do come from China, they're they're making pretty good stuff in terms of telescopes and um, cameras. Just don't buy any eclipse glasses from China because remember that those were garbage in 2017. So then there's also Vixen. I think their line's getting more limited, uh, but this is a classic that was very popular back in the day, and it's still good today. Uh, this is the R200SS 8-inch F4. Um, if you do look for Vixen's current line of telescopes, just a quick warning, uh, when you go to Google or whatever, make sure you type in Vixen telescopes. Don't just type in Vixen, because boy, will you, will, will you get an eyeful. <laughs> so just be careful there. Uh, so here's an image with my Astrotech 8-inch F4. This is at the uh, 2010 Okie Tech Star Party when the double cluster had a visitor, Comet Hartley 2. This was hard to process because, uh, of course, the comet is moving during this series of exposures here. Only over 15 minutes, but I used uh, Deep Sky Stacker's Comet Mode, so it does some special pro processing separate for the Deep Sky object and the comet. And after a few tries, I finally got one that looks pretty decent. So it, it wasn't a very bright comet, but there's a little fuzzball uh, moving by the double cluster. And I was pretty happy with the way that some of the star colors uh, turned out. So you can see again, it's with my 550D. I mentioned the Astrotech. This is with my old Celestron C gem. It worked pretty good at the Okitech star party. Uh, but eventually I started having auto guiding issues where the auto guider would just constantly ding at me. I tried to modify it. Um, I did that, didn't do a good enough job, I thought. I sent it in, came back, I tried it again, wasn't happy with the guiding. And then finally, I just gave up, sold it, and got myself the Mach 1. Uh, so you can start with the lower end stuff, you know, from Mead and Celestron and Skywatcher. But eventually, if you really get into this, you're going to want to get yourself a good mount. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Mach 1 has been a really good mount to me. So here's another shot of M8 by me. You may have heard me mention this before. M8, the Lagoon Nebula, is my favorite deep sky object. Every summer, I try to observe this. It's, it's a good way for me to check the sky quality because I know the nebulosity around this area pretty well. So the more nebulosity I can see, I know the better the sky is. And every time I get a new camera or new telescope or new mount, I take an image of this thing. This one was taken some time ago, though, but um, so this is the Lagoon Nebula with my modified 550D or T2I with the Astrotech 8 inch F4 on the old uh, C gem. And we have 58 90 second shots at ISO 800. And uh, I took this from the Kalamazoo area. This is south of Kalamazoo, the, the city of Kalamazoo, from my secret, quote, secret dark sky site at the back of a cemetery. I know it's a little creepy, but, it, but it's pretty good. 
Here's another shot from KAS member Pete Mumbauer. So here we have the Triangulum Galaxy M33 taken with his old school CCD camera. It seems weird to call it that. Uh, this was taken before he got that Astrophysics 1100. Uh, the Celestron CGE Pro uh, was a very good performer for him. Uh, had very low air correction, but eventually he wanted to upgrade to something even better and got that astrophysics. And so here you can see it's a whopping six hours and 10 minutes. And for some people, that's nothing. Um, so you can see his range of exposures through LRGB filters here. So some people can go overkill with their mount because like Roland Christensen from astrophysics will tell you, uh, the First three rules of astrophotography are, you know, a good mount, a good mount, a good mount. Get yourself a very steady mount because the best optics in the world are worthless without a good, steady equatorial mount, whether it be a German mount, a harmonic mount, or whatever. So whoever this is took that to heart. So here's a Paramount ME with a, a Takahashi uh, 60 or 70 millimeter, I forget the exact aperture of this thing, but uh, this scope, uh, this mount has like a 200 pound capacity and this thing can't weigh more than maybe 15 pounds, if, if even that. So uh, some people stay, take the steadiness uh, a little too seriously. So it doesn't have to be this extreme though, to be steady. So here are just some good German equatorial mounts uh, to get going. Celestron has the advanced VX mount. I mentioned earlier, a lot of people weren't happy with the Star Adventure GTI only having 11 pound capacity. They were hoping it was around 24, 25 pounds. And I was like, why don't you just get an advanced VX? Because the advanced VX has a 30 pound capacity and it costs around $900. My, my prices here might be a little dated. Uh, there's a successor to the C-Gem mount that I have, uh, or had, I don't know of the exact improvements they've made between the original C-Gem and the C-Gem 2, but the C-Gem holds about 40 pounds, and that costs around $1,700, maybe closer to $2,000. Uh, as I mentioned, with the C-Gems, there are uh, modification kits you can buy to try to upgrade it a little bit more. I don't know if it was worth it for me because, like I said, I still wasn't happy with the performance of my modified C-Gem. So I just sold it and got the uh, Astrophysics Mach 1. And then, as mentioned, the CGX is a very good performer for, for your high-end mount. It holds 55 pounds and only cost about $2,300 or so. So, so this is a very good performer. So if you can't spend the thousands and thousands of dollars for an astrophysics, uh, a CGX is a pretty good way to go. Ioptron has quite a few mounts. Uh, the first one here, yes, it is not a German equatorial mount. Don't, don't yell at me. This is one of their center balance mounts. It's kind of like a German mount. You know, it has a counterweight, but you can see the, the balance point. And the pivot here, the tilt is a bit different. So this is their line of center balance mounts, but I just kind of group them in here with German equatorial mounts. It's, it's, it's kind of a hybrid version of a German mount. And basically the number is the weight capacity in pounds. So the CEM40 uh, cost about $2,600 and supports about 40 pounds weight. Sorry, I don't know what that is in kilograms off the top of my head. Uh, here's their German equatorial mount version. Uh, and obviously, the, the number, again, is the weight capacity. So 45 pounds for roughly the same price as the center balance mount, even though it has five pounds more capacity. And then their big one is the, the CEM70, which has a 70-pound capacity. So very good quality there. And again, that's around $3,300. Not terribly bad. Uh, Lost Mandy has those well machined ones, and they've been around a long time, so the design should be pretty much perfected. Uh, there's the GMN, GM8 that holds 30 pounds, cost about $2,500, and the G11 holds about 60 pounds, and those went for around $3,400. Um, I believe that includes the price for the Gemini go to system, but the, the go to system may be a little bit more. By, I think by default, they should come with the go-to system nowadays, you know, back then, but when they were first sold, they didn't, but it seems like nowadays they, they should, but I don't know everything in intimate detail, I'm sorry.
Uh, Mead has come out with some better German Equatorial mounts over the years. For, for quite a while, they were just known for their fork-mounted Schmidt Cassegrains, but they have tried to do better in the German Equatorial mount region. And yes, Mead is owned by Orion now. Uh, they still have the LX85 kind of a version of the C-Gem mount. Uh, it holds uh, 33 pounds and uh, last I knew was under $1,000. So that's a pretty good starter one. Probably more, more comparison to the VX as opposed to the C-Gem, I would suppose. Uh, then much more bulkier, more expensive, is the LX850. Uh, this supports a whopping 90 pounds, but cost about $7,500. But, but it is very nice. Orion has changed their mounts a bit over the years. Uh, they might not exactly have the Skyview Pro anymore, I don't think, uh, but you can probably still find these on the used market. Uh, this one only holds about 20 pounds, so it's kind of a more bulkier, not as portable Star Tracker kind of. Um, so again, 20 pounds for about $1,000. And I, again, I, I, I believe the, the listing of Orion mounts is current in the notes, but I... I didn't think to update it here. There, there's just too much going on with the Eclipse right now. I'm sorry. Uh, but again, these are all available on the used market. And then they did have the Sirius uh, EQG, uh, which held 30 pounds. But again, please check the notes for the latest versions of Orion German Equatorial mounts. I, I apologize for forgetting about that part. Uh, Skywatcher has really come on the scene over the years with their line of Ger German Equatorial mounts. Uh, they have the EQM35 which holds about 22 pounds, and that's about $1,000. They have the EQ6-R uh, Pro. This one holds 44 pounds, and it's about $2,000. So uh, for the beginner, really get in, getting into prime focus, deep sky astrophotography, uh, this is a really good one to consider here. Um, that, one's, that one became very popular with imagers. They have a little more robust, the EQ8-R, this one holds 110 pounds and is about $6,400. And they also have the EQ8-RH, uh, which has absolute encoders. So absolute encoders uh, really help improve the tracking of the mount. So you can do up to 10-minute unguided exposures, assuming your, your, your polar alignment is really good. But this costs about $10,500. But for a mount with absolute encoders, that's a really good price. So with polar alignment, you can buy a polar alignment scope. Uh, but now uh, QHY CCD has this cool device called a pole master. So it can be adapted to pretty much any type of mount. Um, they have a wide variety of adapters. That's what the little picture up here is supposed to show. Uh, so even if it doesn't necessarily thread into your a uh, uh, polar scope opening there, uh, th there are adapters you can get to make it adaptable. So the uh, pole master has a field of view of 11 by 8 degrees, has a resolution of 30 arc seconds of the North Celestial Pole. Uh, it has a rough precision of about five arc minutes, which is pretty good. Um, it has three M3 screws to attach the mount adapter, again sold separately. Uh, it measures about 40 millimeters by 50.7 millimeters. Uh, has very low power consumption, doesn't weigh anything, and of course, because it's really on the mount, it doesn't really add to your mount's weight capacity. But even, even if it does to a small degree, it only weighs like a quarter of a pound. So with the software that you download uh, separately, it basically guides you of where to put Polaris to get a really accurate polar alignment. So even with high-end mounts, uh, you can use the uh, Pole Master uh, as opposed to using a more traditional polar alignment scope that some mounts come with and some you have to buy separately. So I mentioned eventually I, I gave up with the bead Celestron mounts and got myself an astrophysics. Mine isn't shown here because it's now been supplanted. Uh, the Mach 1 is now the old version. Now they have the Mach 2 from astrophysics. So from astrophysics, you have the Mach 2, you have the uh, 1100 GTO and the 1600 GTO. Uh, the 1600 holds about 220 pounds. I think the 1100 is, oh, I don't remember exactly, probably around, I don't know, 150 pounds or so. Uh, the Mach 1 is probably around 40 pounds. 
And then uh, Paramount has several. They have three. I only show two here. Uh, so, so they do have the whole Paramount line. There's the, the Paramount uh, My T, you know, capital M, lowercase Y, capital T, My T. Get it? Very, very clever. Uh, there's the Paramount MX and the Paramount ME2. We use the Paramount ME2 on the remote telescope in Arizona. Uh, 10 micron makes some very good German equatorial mounts, very high quality. And ASI has some very good mounts too. Uh, I believe the ASIs are Italian, but the 10 microns, the paramounts, and the astrophysics, they are all American made. No, oh, I'm sorry. 10 micron is uh, Italian as well. I think these are the Italian mounts. On the left side here are the American made mounts. But no. ASI is Austrian. So Austrian, Italian, American. There you go. So we have a 1600 mount in our observatory here at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. So here is inside OWL Observatory, owned by the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. And on top of our 1600 mount, we have a, a Mead 16 inch. Uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. You can see we have a starlight focuser on the back because the the regular focuser has too much image shift, as they all do, with a Teleview 101 writing piggyback. So if you are a member of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society and live in the area, uh, you can take the uh, short training session and you can use this setup. The skies at the Nature Center aren't the best, but uh, you can do some decent imaging out there. So here are some other necessary accessories that you might need to do deep sky prime focus astrophotography. Uh, if you do live in a pretty light polluted area, you can do processing. You know, if you get really good at processing, you can basically uh, almost put a handle on light pollution between doing kind of short exposures and processing. You don't necessarily need filters, but uh, these kind of dual band, multi band, quad band filters that have com come on the scene in recent years have really helped people uh, do some nice imaging from very light polluted skies. It began with OPT's triad filters, uh, but now OTP has gone out of business. Uh, oh, that's Oceanside Photo and Telescope. No one apparently has bought the Triad line, and frankly, they were grossly overpriced for what they were. Um, very quickly after the Triad filters came out, Optolong released basically filters that had identical performance but cost hundreds of dollars less. So I have the current list of Optolong filters in the notes, but if you're just ju doing a general uh, imaging of, you know, open clusters, reflection nebulae, galaxies. Uh, you can get the uh, original L-Pro filter. They even have an L, uh, like, quad filter that's pretty good for uh, a variety of imaging. More specific for nebulae, there's the L-Enhanced, the L-Extreme, and the L-Ultimate. There's just all kinds of filters from Optolong now. So they're, they're very affordable. There's versions that clip into your DSLR or DSLM camera or just ones you filter on to the, your camera adapter and you can go from there. So they're, they're really uh, affordable. I've even heard a story or, uh, from a guy that does imaging from his high rise in Toronto, Canada, and he does nice imaging from you know that extremely light polluted area. I hear Toronto is a very nice town, but it's extremely light polluted as all major cities are. So you're going to want to get yourself some dew prevention. We talked about this more last time, but obviously it's even more important for astrophotography because you don't want to go through the trouble of setting up in the field unless you have an observatory and just get dewed out after an hour. So make sure you do have a good dew prevention system, but uh, you know, see the part four lecture for a little bit more. Uh, these are good for just visual use, but if you do have a Newtonian reflector for astrophotography, you want to get yourself a, a, a Cheshire eyepiece and even a laser collimator. Uh, you can always do a st star test. Every time I use my Cheshire and laser collimator, I always just do a quick star test before I start taking images. But uh, you, you, you got to make sure your Newtonian is properly collimated. Uh, it's even more important for astrophotography than it is for visual use. And, and the, the faster the system is, like an F4, especially F2, the really more important uh, this becomes. 
So again, laser collimator as well. Th th there are many available. If you have a refractor or Schmidt Cassegrain, especially, you're going to want to get yourself a nice focal reducer slash field flattener. Some don't really need the uh, f uh, flattener, so there are just uh, uh, focal reducers, but most are focal reducers slash field flatteners. And so um, for Celestron's Edge HD telescopes, they have dedicated uh, focal reducers for each one. They're actually made by Teleview. Not many people know that. But the ones that Celestron carry, they're actually manufactured by Teleview. But, but, but Celestron sells them. Just a little known fact there. Uh, and so for your more traditional schmidt cassegrain they do have the standard F6.7 focal reducer. Uh, but hopefully any refractor you buy... We'll, we'll have a dedicated focal reducer. Teleview does kind of have an all-purpose one, but it, it is best to have a focal reducer specifically designed for uh, the refractor that you get. If you have a Newtonian, especially a fast one, uh, you absolutely want a coma corrector. Because um, remember, coma, the stars look like little comets on the edge of the field of view. It's uh, more prevalent in faster systems. So you absolutely have to have a coma corrector if you have anything from an F2 to an F4. A little bit slower, maybe not so critical, but it can help. I've always personally preferred to do guide scopes. I've never had any issue. A lot of people uh, uh, say don't do guide scopes because you might get uh, image flexure in the system, which can cause you to lose a guide star. But um, maybe that was part of the problem I had with the CGEM. Uh, but like I said, with my astrophysics Mach 1, I do a guide scope. I've never lost an image ever. Uh, so I guess it just depends maybe on the mount. But um, again, I've always preferred a guide scope. It can be just a dedicated refractor or just one you just use for guiding. Uh, many fi finder scopes can be converted to uh, guide scopes. So if you do want to purchase a newer uh, finder scope and get in the astrophotography, maybe try to get one that can work as a guide scope as well. It's good to multi-purpose this thing. But a lot of people, uh, a lot of the more experienced imagers will say, don't get the guide scope or Eventually, you're going to want to get yourself an aux axis guider. I've never been a big fan of them. It's too much work to look for a guide star for me. I always seem to have trouble, but I know some folks that seem to use them and get guide stars without any problem, but I have the worst luck in the world. Back in the old days, you had to guide your image all by yourself, the old-fashioned way, looking through a crosshair eyepiece for maybe 45 minutes to an hour at a time. But today... Auto guiders and computers take all the work uh, uh, away from you. So there are many auto guiders out there now. Uh, Orion has sold a gazillion, uh, don't quote me on that, of the Starshoot auto guiders that use a little tiny CCD chip. But there are some from um, ZWO uh, that have a very high quantum efficiency and make very excellent auto guiders. So Really, ZWO almost has the corner on the market in auto guiders now. They have many good ones available. Uh, so definitely, it, if you use a guide scope or an off-axis off guider, you're going to want to get yourself an, an auto guider. You're still want to get your. You're still going to want to get a good, good old-fashioned reticle eyepiece. Of course, you can use the Pole Master for polar alignment, uh, but I still like to use the reticle eyepiece just to maybe check the drift alignment of my telescope. You know to get the polar alignment maybe even a little bit better, or I just use it to just get the go-to down. Th these days, I just use it to get the go-to of the mount accurate and then move on from there and never look at it again. But it's still handy to have a re re reticle eyepiece with an illuminated um, illuminator uh, as well. Because, you know, they're only like 100 bucks, and it's just good to have one handy. And I don't talk about uh, uh, focusing motors today, automated focusers. Uh, but if you don't want to spend the money for, for a focusing motor yet to automate that for you, uh, I highly recommend a Betanov mask. So here's a version here. This is the type for Schmidt Cassegrains. The, 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 the versions for refractors are a little more full frame or full, full featured here, set of kind of off axis like like this here. So here's what a Betanov mask looks like when you point it at a bright star. You get these uh, diffraction spikes. 
And when you turn the focus, both spikes, both sets of spikes move, but you can see it really appears just the center one moves. So you want to get the center one there, you know, evenly spaced between the two cross uh, spikes there, and then you're in focus. And using my Betanov mask, I can usually get the focus a lot faster than an automated focuser uh, system can. Because, yeah, you can use uh, some of the software we'll mention here and uh, or Focus Max uh, to automatically focus it, but I can do it much quicker. So the one area where I'm still learning is with the image calibration and image processing, but I'm trying to get better all the time. So back in the old film days, basically what you see is what you got. And But today, the real skill in it is with the image processing. So even though CMOS cameras are getting better all the time, you're going to want to take some dark frames. You want to take at least 20 of those. Uh, some people take even more, upwards of 50 dark frames uh, to help subtract what little noise is left from your stacking. With my DSLR, and even with the CMOS camera we have in the observatory here, I usually just use dithering because uh, I really don't have time to make a library of dark frames uh, you know, especially, you know, with your digital SLR camera, you have to have it at the right temperature because, you know, you can't really control the temperature of your camera. Um, so I use dithering instead of dark frames, and it's always worked great for me. So what dithering does is between every new exposure, it shifts the image maybe by a few pixels, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, and it helps reduce noise without doing dark frames. And, you know, again, because CMOS cameras are getting so low in noise, um, unless I can take a series of library shots for a, a cooled camera, which, you know, takes time, uh, I've always preferred dithering. For DSLR, it's worked great for me. But if you have a cooled camera and have the time, then yeah, you can make a library of dark frames. But with the DSLR, it's not that easy. Bias signal is becoming less and less important. Uh, what bias is, is that basically all digital cameras inherently have a base level of readout noise as it reads the value of each pixel of the sensor. So that is bias. But again, a lot of people are saying CMOS cameras are getting so good, you don't need to take bias images as well, you, you can do away with that. But basically, uh, to subtract the bias signal, uh, you take the shortest image you can with your camera. Usually with like a DSLR, it's like one four thousandths of a second. And no matter how hard you try, you're probably gonna get dust on your sensor eventually. Sometimes it can be a pain to clean that off, or you might get what's called vignetting where the entire field isn't illuminated and you get these dark edges. So dust, vignetting, that can be subtracted out fairly easily with a flat field frame. And a lot of people say, if you do a flat field, um, then you gotta do a flat dark as well. I've never done really much in the way with flat darks. I never found them necessary, but some people do. But, you know, so experiment, see what works best for you. So here's some astrophotography software real quick. I won't go into this in detail. Uh, when I did astrophotography with my DSLR, I used uh, Backyard EOS and found it to be very handy. They also came out with Backyard Nikon to control your Nikon cameras. Maxim DL is getting a little dated. Um, this is what we have to use for the remote telescope out west that we have because we use ACP, the astronomer's control panel, which is required to work with Maxim. Um, the, the one I would really look into if you're looking for a, a, a camera control image acquisition program is NINA, Nighttime Imaging in, in Astronomy, because it is absolutely free. It's open source. Lots of people have contributed to it, and it's a very powerful free program. Sequence Generator Pro um, is the version I have on my laptop here or the version we have in our observatory. I know a couple other members that have used it, uh, but the bad thing about Sequence Generator Pro is it's not free and you got to pay the yearly subscription to keep it up to date. And a lot of people hate that. So here is uh, Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, this window here is Sequence Generator Pro. This is Sequence Generator Pro. This is PhD2 for the auto guiding. And this is uh, dome control. 
Uh, the one I don't know much about, I've never really looked into, is Cyril. Uh, I've heard good things about it, but it is also free. So because it's free, it's definitely worth looking into. But um, if you really want to save money and want one that's really, really good, I highly recommend Nina. Check that out. Uh, for image calibration and aligning and stacking, there's Deep Sky Stacker. I mentioned that previously with my image of the double cluster and the comet. Uh, I use the comet mode of that to, to get that image. So Deep Sky Stacker is free. I know a lot of people that use more expensive programs like PixInsight that we'll mention here shortly, uh, that they still use Deep Sky Stacker to stack the images. Why, I don't know. PixInsight does a good job and it's easy, but I guess a lot of people just like Deep Sky Stacker. So there are lots of uh, options for image processing. GIMP Shop is free. Uh, but of course, uh, most people either use Photoshop, Lightroom, or PixInsight. Photoshop, Lightroom, of course, you got to pay the yearly subscription fee, uh, which can add up over time. But given how much newer versions of Photoshop were back before they had the subscription base, uh, it's still really affordable. Uh, compared to that, but it's still, you know, over $100 a year for the subscription. PixInsight has a one-time cost of probably around 250 upwards of $300 now. And all the updates that I've gotten over the past few years I've had PixInsight have been free. They, I don't think they're ever going to offer a, a subscription service. I hope they don't. Uh, but P PixInsight gets more and more powerful all the time. Just recently, they released a new gradient tool that really helps reduce gradients, basically with a push of the button. And R Russell Crowman has Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator. Um, I forget the other one. Someone could post it in the chat. Uh, but uh, R Russell Crowman has very powerful tools that, that's meant to work with PixInsight. And there's also Star Tools, but again, I don't know as much about that version there. But before you get the processing, uh, you're going to want to uh, calibrate your monitor so you can get one of these Spider X Elites uh, colorometer display calibration tool. I bought one. And of course, as soon as you start working with the software, one of the first questions it'll ask you is what type of monitor do you have? It gives you a list of phrases I didn't know. So that got me stuck there. I haven't had the chance to go back and work with it. But uh, if you know your monitor pretty well, um, Usually they're pretty good as they come, but to, to make it perfect, you want to make sure it's properly calibrated. And you can get one of these. The 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 pro version's about 170 bucks. The elite version, which you really don't need uh, for astrophotography, is 270 bucks. So finally, we'll talk about solar system imaging. In many ways, this can be a little more challenging than deep sky imaging, just because you're at the mercy of the scene. So uh there are many ways to capture images of the sun, moon, and planets. The classic way is the afocal method. Uh, back in the old days, this meant you just kind of held up your uh, SLR camera with a lens, uh, you know, tried to hold it very steady and uh, take some pictures that way. But now with smartphones, uh, afocal imaging has made a comeback. So Celestron, Orion, Teleview, they have adapters specifically meant for smartphones where you can adapt it to the eyepiece for the telescope and take very nice shots of the sun and the moon and stuff like that. Uh, you can also do eyepiece projection. This is great for DSLR, DSLM cameras. I know Jerry Rodriguez has taken many good images with a DSLR camera using eyepiece projection. So with a refractor of Newtonian, you put the eyepiece inside a variable projection camera adapter. So you, you remove the lens and the uh, eyepiece image is projected into your camera. Uh, for schmidt cassegrains you again put an eyepiece inside the tele-extender and that threads onto the back of your schmidt cassegrain For prime focus, uh, again, you need stuff like this. Some of it I, I mentioned already. There's T-adapters, T-rings, um, and focal reducers. So, so all that I've already mentioned, but you can do that as well. For, for capturing the sun and the moon. So you do have thousands of images uh, that you can take, but if you wanna take some of the guesswork out of how long you can expose the moon, 
in your camera. There's this little equation here. I got this from Michael Covington's astrophotography for the amateur. Uh, he, he, he did have a more modern version for digital cameras, but the version I have is for old school film cameras. And this should still work for, you know, the more sensitive uh, digital cameras. So you basically have uh, F is the F stop squared divided by uh, A, the ISO setting, times B, the brightness. And so here are the numbers. Whoops. Here are the numbers you can use for the various phases of the moon. Obviously, uh, the larger the number, the brighter the moon. So, you know, 10 for a thin, dim crescent, 20 for a full moon. But obviously, when you're out taking pictures of the moon, even though a calculation might give you one number, make sure you bracket. So if it tells you to do 1 25th of a second, you know, do images at 1 250th or 1 260th. You know, take some images a little shorter, a little longer based on the current conditions because you never know what it's going to be like. So here is one of my images of the full moon taken with a, a Canon 550D and my old TMB refractor. 1 200th of a second at ISO 100. I always tend to stay pretty low in ISO with lunar imaging. And so uh, some regions around here are pretty hard to not overexpose. So that one turned out pretty well. Now for imaging the planets, uh, many people tried doing it with film back in the old days, but they realized just how hard it was. Uh, then we switched over to webcams. I have fond memories of using the old 2U cam because uh, that became very popular uh, to do planetary imaging back in the early 2000s. But now uh, all, all the main dealers, all the main manufacturers have dedicated planetary imaging cameras. Canon has the next image cameras. Uh, imaging Source has several to choose from. The Luminera ones are getting a little dated now. They haven't updated those in years. They're pretty low in resolution, uh, but sometimes for the planets, it's not terribly important. Uh, Player One has the Mars cameras. They have Saturn uh, model cameras and Uranus cameras uh, that are very good. Here are just the Mars M monocameras, monochrome. So you have to use color filters to get color images of the planets. Uh, but monochrome images are best for solar imaging. Uh, Orion has a line of them. Again, some of these have changed recently, I believe. But Orion did or has the star shoot line. Uh, Point Grey Flea. Uh, the, the Point Grey Flea 3 cameras were very popular with some of the more famous planetary imagers. But of course, ZWO... Uh, most images you see nowadays are from ZWO cameras because not only do they have cooled uh, astrophoto cameras for deep sky imaging, but they have some very nice planetary imaging cameras too. Some of these have maybe changed recently, but uh, these are some of the really popular ones that have been there over the past few years or so. But again, the, there are many to choose from, just too many to discuss here today. But So just spend some time giving ZWO and you might go to them. But uh, the player ones are considered a little higher end. And that's what some of the more serious planetary imagers do. But if you want to start low with, with the cost and have a bit of a more easy learning curve, uh, ZWO is probably the way to go. So here's the crater Plato. A lot of people know Plato because it's filled in with lava there. So the, the floor of the crater is very flat. So this is with the ZWO ASI 174 taken with a 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain and a 2X Barlow. The moon's pretty bright, so you can get, get, <laughs> get away with that. Uh, so what you do here is you record a video, you know, of basically like a two, three-minute video maybe. And during those two, three minutes, you get thousands of images. And then you put them into a, a image processing program uh, and stack those. And there's settings that you can uh, play with that automatically pick the sharpest, best images that uh, work around the scene conditions. So uh, the moon is pretty easy to get pretty good shots off of. This one is especially sharp here. But of course, you can get lots of great images with the planets. I don't know who took the one of Mars here, but I found this one online. It was taken with a 20 inch Dobsonian and a 5X PowerMate to, to give it F19. 
And so a really good image of Mars through a big dob. You usually wouldn't associate uh, big dobs for good planetary imaging scopes like that. But here we have Saturn with a ZWO ASI uh, 183 and a series of Jupiter images with the ASI 290 MC. Again, take a, a short video with, with Jupiter, especially because it rotates so fast. You can't go several minutes, maybe a minute or two. Uh, but there's even uh, programs to help adjust for Jupiter's rotation. Uh, I believe it's called Wind Jupos or so, 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 something along that line. And there, there's so much out there. This image, uh, I just wanted to keep this one in here. Uh, this is by uh, the late Roger Williams, one of our best members that we had. Uh, Roger Williams just passed away. Uh, at the end of July, and he did some deep sky imaging, but he was a really good solar imager. Uh, so here's a very nice image from KAS member Roger Williams with his uh, older Luminera Skynex 2-1 two, two camera and his Coronado Maxscope 70, which now belongs to the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society and is available to loan to uh, members. Obviously, uh, this is with a hydrogen alpha telescope, but if you take images of sunspots or the partial phases of a solar eclipse, like the one coming up, don't forget a solar filter. Obviously, they go over the front of your telescope. So there's some handsome devil, looks uh, just like me, really, um, with his 5-inch uh, stellar view and his 65-millimeter uh, AstroTech refractor. So that's me in Wyoming during the 2017 eclipse, if you couldn't tell from my T-shirt there. And finally, just make sure you keep an imager's log. Your camera is going to record a lot of this today. And with some of the image acquisition uh, programs you have today, you can customize the file name so it saves even stuff like the subject of what you're taking a picture of. Because I can remember many times taking stuff with film, but... You don't use up the whole roll for months and you look back on the images and you're thinking, what was I trying to take a picture of again? Uh, so it is good to make a note somewhere of what you're trying to image, either in the notebook or in the file name of the image. And again, the camera is going to do this for you, but uh, just make sure you keep track of the date and time. Uh, the one thing you might have to make note of yourself is the location uh, you know, either by latitude, longitude, or just say, you know, backyard observatory, you know where you are. Uh, the one thing you'll have to add again to your log is this current sky conditions. You know, what's the transparency? What's the scene? You, you can get uh, uh, adept at rating that with time. Of course, your camera is going to be noted in the uh, uh, data file of your image. But again, I like to keep a separate log. Uh, all the instruments used, not necessarily, uh, you know, the camera, the mount, but, you know, filters, focal reducers, auto guiders, stuff like that. Make sure you keep track of all that stuff. Make sure you keep track of the length of the exposure, too. That's also, you know, kept in the file these days, but it's good to make sure you keep track of that. I already mentioned keep track of filters, if any, like Optolong's filters. What RGB filters did you use? What narrowband filters did you use? And any other accessories, again, like focal reducers, auto guiders. You can even make a note of the processing software that you used and the processing steps that you took. So ultimately, if you get really good at this stuff, uh, you can start taking images like this. This is uh, I can get something like this with our remote telescope, but I'm not nearly as good as Martin Pugh is here with the processing. I have an image of M13 that looks pretty respectable, uh, but it's not quite this good. It's pretty good, though. And uh, so here's M13. This is a nine-hour total exposure, uh, three hours each for the RGB filters, so no luminance filter. And here's just a lovely galaxy, NGC 6744. Um, not terribly visible from the northern hemisphere, but I've always liked this galaxy because if we could view the Milky Way from the outside, it would look a lot like this. So here is 17 and a half hours through some pretty high-end equipment. I'll show you more specifically what telescope it was taken with here shortly. And then here is over 54 hours, closer to 55 hours of exposure uh, of the Orion Nebula, just to bring out the extended range of nebulosity this has. 
So all those images, M13, the Galaxy, the Orion Nebula, that was taken with a 20-inch plane wave like this one. So here is the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's remote telescope, uh, which is in a member's observatory at Arizona Sky Village. So uh, they have very dark skies there. But here we have our 20-inch uh, plane wave on, on a Paramount ME, riding piggyback as our Takahashi, which is currently in for service to help hopefully correct the optical issues we've had. And we have two STX-16803 CCD cameras. Uh, we are looking to perhaps sell these to sort of slash upgrade slash downgrade uh, to the more modern CMOS cameras. The more mo Again, the more modern CMOS cameras have lower noise, but uh, electronically speaking, these are far superior uh, than any of the ZWO or QHY cameras you can get today. And this little white screen is our flat field screen that we use for the 20 inch. The Takahashi has one built in called a flip flap. So here is an uh, image taken from Arizona Sky Village, taken by the late, great Terrence Dickinson. And he showed us this image before we even put the remote telescope in. So this just gave us a preview for how, how dark the skies at Arizona Sky Village are, because there's no substitute for dark skies. The filters available today can do a pretty good job. Image processing can help get a, rid of a lot of it. But if you're very fortunate, um, you can have very dark skies or at least have a telescope under very dark skies like we do here in the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. So that concludes the five-part introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series. I hope you found it valuable and I hope it does make you a star hopping sky master. So I hope to see you under the stars on the next clear night.